Now, we did some exercises in the morning to show that the attention has to be controlled and the location of the attention is the most important thing for meditation. I keep on emphasizing this because after I was initiated for quite a long time, I made a mistake. I thought that sitting with the eyes closed and looking at the darkness in front was good enough for meditation. I thought that having a nice chair with a good cushion and calling it meditation chair was good enough. I thought putting a nice fluffy pillow or cushion in a corner of my room and calling it my meditation corner and sitting and meditating there and closing my eyes and repeating the words was good enough. It took me some years to find out none of this was good enough. That if we concentrate on improving the chair on which we sit, most of our attention goes to the chair and not to ourselves. If we develop a particular corner to sit in a good plush pillow, the pillow gets the attention. So when we make these external arrangements, it uh, takes our attention away and you do not see much result. So you have to be meditating for a long time and you wonder, where those great lights and sounds are, which they talk about. Therefore, I had to go back to great master to get an understanding of it. And he said that unless you first locate yourself in your imagination, in your head, <coughs> behind the eyes, you should not even start meditation. That means the place for meditating is not outside place for meditating is inside our body, it's inside our head, it is the area right behind the eyes. When we close our eyes and we see outside the darkness, it's the same outside that we see with our eyes open. Closing the eyes does not take us inside. Closing the eyes merely shuts off the view outside. So therefore, it's not good enough just to close the eyes and think you are meditating. Therefore, you have to imagine. Again, we used an exercise in the morning in which you had imaginary flowers, imaginary snacks, imaginary drinks. The idea of that exercise was to show that by imagination, you can create any condition you want. And since the attention goes along with the imagination, therefore, instead of forcing yourself to think inward and roll your eyes back to figure out what the place is behind your eyes, you merely imagine that you are sitting inside the head. Like any imagination, supposing I were to ask you to think that you are sitting on this table. Just imagine you are here. You know, how many of you can imagine that you are sitting on the table? That's exactly it. Was there any strain on your head? Was there any strain on your body? Was there any strain on your eyes? It is a pure act of imagination that your attention went to the table and you imagine that you were there. It's in the same way that you imagine that you are inside your head behind the eyes. With those trains, it's not a physical exercise. It's purely an exercise in imagination to draw your attention there. So if you close your eyes and you feel, you can always feel your body. You can always know where your hands are without your eyes open. You know where the body is, there's a feel of the body. In the feel of the body, you know where the head is and you imagine you are sitting inside the head. How to confirm it? You feel your ears have now gone on either side. The eyes are in front of you. The top of the head is the top of you. So that again involves imagination. If you can imagine properly that you are in the center of your head with no strain on the eyes, no physical strain of any kind, your imagination, you are withdrawing your attention to the right place. And that is where it sh should be in order to do any kind of meditation. Of course, in the, in the initiation that many of you have obtained from masters, some of you have already practiced this, and you know that once you are there, there are two types of, uh, three types of uh, activity that would be called meditation. One is the repetition of words. 
repetition of a mantra. Whatever the master says, these are holy words or these are words which will concentrate your attention. You repeat those words. The idea of repeating words while you are imagining you are in the center of the head is that your attention goes to the words and not to other thoughts. If you do not repeat words and merely imagine you are in the center of the head, your mind will be thinking of so many other things. And I'll tell you this, if you are not repeating words, the mind will think of things far away from you. Think of your friends far away, think of what you forgot to do, think of what you have to do tomorrow. So the mind will be driven away because whatever you will be thinking about in your thoughts will be where your attention will go. So the attention will not stay in the place which you have chosen to meditate, which is the center of the head behind the eyes. So that is why you repeat these words and that's the main purpose, physical purpose of the repetition of the words is that you squeeze out the words of thought and you replace them with the words of the mantra and you concentrate on repeating those words so that your attention gets focused on those words rather than other thoughts. If you repeat the words and you still think of something else, you can go far away. Kabir says, Kabir was one of the very famous Indian mystic. He says, if you have a rosary in your hand and you are moving the beads regularly, if you are repeating the Simran, the repetition with your tongue, your mind is running away, that don't call it Simran at all. It's not any kind of meditation because you are running all over the world with your mind. So that is why when you repeat the words, it is not enough merely to repeat the word. It's more important to hear the words you are repeating. Because it's only when we listen to something, our attention gets riveted there. So, the best kind of meditation when practice comes, when you don't repeat the words at all, you direct your mind to repeat the words, and you sit next to it and listen to the words. And that happens over time. It's a little practice that is required. And then you have no problem because then the mind will start doing what you are supposed to do. You become a listener. The mind is repeating these words in the center of the head. You are listening. Your attention will be gathered very quickly to the center of the head. And from there, it will withdraw from the body and you will have astral experiences coming up very quickly. These are very essential things and we miss on them. I missed many years of practice because I did not understand fully the significance of uh, imagining that you are in the head and listening to the words rather than repeating them. I thought repetition was good enough, but repetition like a parrot means nothing because the mind thinks in several channels. While you may be repeating the words in one channel, another channel keeps on commenting upon it. Oh, you're going too fast. No, that's too slow. No, when will I finish this? And at the same time, while you're thinking these thoughts, the mind is also repeating the words. That repetition is not good enough. But if you listen intently with those words in your head, then they serve a real purpose of drawing your attention to the center. The second part of meditation for those who have been initiated is listening to the sound current. The sound current is automatic and in all of us. Every human being has a sound current inside the head and spreads out in terms of consciousness, awareness throughout the body and from the body spreads out to the whole world. The sound current is not really a sound. It is consciousness itself. It is the descent of consciousness from our totality, from such kind, stage by stage, creates all the different stages on the way creates all the levels of consciousness and eventually in the human physical frame it settles down and creates our human experience spreading out first as an experience of our own body and then experience of everything that is outside the body the same sound current we call it why do we call it a sound current when it's a creative power it's a creative power that is running the whole show it's a creative power that has created the creative power it's the creative, there is a nice, uh, nice uh, Shabad, uh, 
a hymn or a verse in Sarbats and poetry, which describes this, that what is Shabad, what is the word, what is the sound? He said the sound created this earth, sound created the sky, sound created this thing, sound created the creator, and sound created the sound. It goes that far to say, it's a creator of all, including itself. So that is the nature of consciousness. The totality of consciousness is represented by the sound. And why should we call such a strong creative power, which in the Bible John describes as the word. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, in reference to the word, not even to God. If you read all those six um, stanzas, six paragraphs, you will find that the reference made in the Bible to the word is almost identical to the verses in the Rig Veda, in the Sanskrit version of the Rig Veda, where it says, in the beginning was the Nard. The Nard was the sound. In the beginning was the original Nard, and the Nard was with the Creator, and the Nard was the Creator. It's almost a translation. So you will notice that uh, all these descriptions of the creative power have been expressed in some language that represents the sound. The reason why they expressed this creative power, even the creator himself or herself or itself, even the creator is expressed as a sound because when we meditate and want to get in touch with our own consciousness, the consciousness manifests itself like a sound. And that's a great advantage to us that consciousness, which is merely the power of being conscious, which is merely the power of creating and experiencing creation, that that power can be heard and it expresses. Supposing consciousness did not become conscious of anything. Supposing there was pure consciousness with nothing to be conscious of, well, it should cease to exist. Because consciousness per se means it's conscious of something. Otherwise, why do you call it consciousness? So the fact that consciousness per se cannot exist, it has to be conscious of something. When it is conscious only of itself, it expresses itself in the form of a sound or a music or resonance, whatever word we use. Very uh, different frequencies of resonance would also be an expression of the same sound. So the, the essential part of this particular style of meditation, which great master advocated and many mystics have advocated. This called the Surta Shabda Yoga, which means the yoga of the attention and the sound. Surta means attention, Shabda means the sound. And that's the yoga, the union with the reality, with the totality. So the sound is very important. And when you hear the sound, which comes automatically when you gather your attention behind the eyes, it comes automatically. It's already there. Our attention is scattered outside. Therefore, we are not hearing it. We are hearing outside sounds. We are hearing outside expression of consciousness. We are not hearing what is inside. So that is why when we concentrate our attention behind the eyes, the sound appears. When the sound appears and we listen to the sound, we, we are listening to ourselves in the lowest form of expression. Therefore, we are listening to the consciousness that we are trying to reach through this meditation. So, by listening to the sound, we are drawn more to ourselves than anything else. So, it is the best way. I had the opportunities to examine large number of meditation techniques. When I was a teenager, when I was in college, in the university, I ran around looking for all kinds of meditation practices. And I can confess today, this is the best that I could find. That to be drawn to yourself and make a discovery of yourself by listening to the sound of the self, nothing is better than that. That sound pulls you. It pulls you to itself. It has a power and a resonance that lifts you up from whatever experience you are having and draws you to itself. And once it draws to itself, it opens up all the other inner experiences of different levels of consciousness. So that is why this listening to the sound of your resonance of yourself is a very important part of this meditation and it comes naturally. Once you get that and you are able to hold on to that sound, which means that you are not distracted again and again by other things, 
you need not practice any repetition. You need not practice anything else. No need of practicing imagination. No need of doing anything else except listen to that sound. It will draw you up to the highest levels of the creator and the creation. Every level of consciousness can be experienced through that sound. It's a very powerful method and a very powerful sound that exists within all of us. It is not placed there by any human being. It's there created along with our consciousness. It's created because we are conscious beings. Therefore, the sound exists. It may take some time for us to get to the real sound because we are used to all external stimuli and external sounds, external uh, distractions, I might say. And therefore, our attention is not easily drawn to the sound within ourselves. So, it takes time. Meanwhile, till that sound of consciousness can be heard, we can hear some other sounds. We hear some other sounds in the head. Many of them are physical sounds. They arise from our physical body. You can, if you are trying to concentrate, you can even hear the sound of your breathing. You can hear the sound of your heart. You can hear later on even the sound of the blood vessels. And they look musical too at some point. Those are not real sounds. They do not have the pull that the sound of consciousness has. But they are good enough for practice. So I call them practice sounds. I call them, even if you get those sounds, hold on to them because they are still inside your head. And it gives you a little practice how to listen to the sound within you. And I have found that if you practice listening to these practice sounds inside your head, you will be able to reach the real sound also because the attention is still being drawn and maintained in your head and behind the eyes. So that is why even if you hear some other sounds, the other practice sounds which are not purely physical are sounds which are being generated by your sense perceptions or generated by your rest and body. And those sounds can be like the sounds of chirping of birds and chirping of crickets. By little bells ringing and by, by thunder, sound of thunder, sound of roaring of water over on a, on a waterfall. And those kinds of sounds, sound of a train passing near your house, sound of you may suddenly feel there's a train passing, there's no railway track outside. How did I hear that? As part of a practice sound. When these practice sounds, there were 10 or 12 of them listed that they may come before you get to the real sound, which can have a pull. The real sound that has a pull is the sound of a bell, the big bell sound. It has a, it has a up and down, peal, peal of a bell. Dong, dong. That means it has a regular bell peal. But the sound, sound of that bell is very mellow, it's very soft. It does not have, like I described, it has, a, it has a kink in it, but that sound has got smoothness about it. That sound can hold you inside and draw you to your center faster than anything else. And sometimes it can be so fast that you don't like it that way. But uh, if you practice slowly, every day, gradually <coughs> making some progress, you begin to recognize. The sound seems to come from a big distance, from a distance and then becomes closer. The sound uh, becomes closer to you because your attention is getting more towards it. If you stay in the center of the head, the sound keeps on becoming louder. If you try to move towards the sound, it becomes weaker. So there, the sound is therefore not really uh, coming because uh, it's coming from somewhere. It's coming from within you. It, and you move away from the center, the sound becomes weak. You can immediately know the sound is coming because you are in the center behind the eyes in the third eye center, which has been described as the tenth door to open up the door to the astral plane. So this, this uh, sound of the bell <laughs> is like a regular bell, big bell, not a small bell. Small bells are still practice sounds. And the big bell has been copied in almost all traditions. We put the belfries up in our churches. We put the uh, bells in the te temples. We have used similar gongs in so many places of worship. We make artificial sounds like that in almost every house of worship that I have visited. 
and people think that by listening to those outside sounds, we are getting spiritual upliftment. That is not true. It may be very soothing to the nerves, may be pleasing sound, may be aesthetically very good. It is not a spiritual sound. Spiritual sound comes from within ourselves. These sounds were placed outside, as were the houses of worship created outside, to remind us that the real house of worship is our human body. Our head is the real place of worship. They even copied the design of the head. Many of the old temples, old synagogues, old uh, uh, churches had domes on them. And the, if you look at a dome, one of the old places of worship, there are stupas, Buddhist stupas in India. They all have a regular dome, looks like a bald head. Well, they couldn't put hair on it, but they made a good copy. <coughs> they did put some uh, hairstyles of those guys, and they did put some uh, the uh, hair dress, hair dressings of that kind. For example, used to wear long kind of head gear, head gear, and they made the steeples and the size of the temples and churches like that. They copied what was originally uh, indicated as our house of worship. We run around to go to a house of worship, carrying our real house of worship with us on our head. The, the real, uh, the, the, the Bible says the kingdom of God is within you. And this body is the real, in, uh, real temple of God. It's been described in almost all scriptures like that. That if you want to find the truth, go into this temple, not into the outside temples. They are there to guide us. Look for the real temple. Books are there. Look for the real thing. <coughs> we make the same mistake by thinking that by going outside to these places, man-made places, we'll find the truth about the creator who sits inside us. We think by reading books and descriptions of what is inside us, we will go inside. Nobody goes inside just by reading. That's a guide for us. That if you read this and follow up, you'll find the truth inside. The books themselves say it's all inside us. And therefore, we have to um, be guided by our own experiences inside the head. This sound of the bell, which has been copied in several places of worship outside, then transforms itself as you listen to it more carefully. The more attention you place on it, the gap between the peel increases. So instead of long, long, it becomes long and becomes elongated. Ultimately, you could hear only one peel stretched out over indefinite time. And that is the stage where the sound doesn't look like a bell at all because it lost its sine curve. It's lost the up and down. And that resembles something like a conch being blown, something of a some kind of an instrument that has one long sound. So that is the next sound. And these two sounds in combination give you entry into the astral plane. That simple. The system should be so simple that by concentrating your attention behind the eyes, you should be able to have entry into an area where you will see what, where you will go when you die physically where you find out where you were before you were born in this body. I think it's a great information to get just by hearing sound, just by sitting inside the head in an imaginary way and then hearing the sound and getting this information and experience of it. So um, I would like to start this uh, meditation with you by trying to help you to see where the place for med meditation is. That's very important. So, will you please close your eyes and practice through imagination, practice through imagination, sitting behind the eyes. And remember, when you practice this, and since we are calling it a house of worship, consider this body again. In the morning, you consider this body as made of glass with a foreign juice. Now you imagine this body is a mansion, a house which has several floors and each one of the chakras, energy chakras <coughs> below you is one of the floors. You are currently at the sixth floor because you are awake and you are looking through the eyes. When you close your eyes, the feeling should be that you are at that level. If you close your eyes, you don't feel you are in your belly, you don't feel you are in your hands, you feel you are just in the head behind your eyes 
that is the sixth floor of this mansion. So stay on at the sixth floor of your mansion. Make an imaginary floor behind the eyes, an imaginary floor. Place, place your cushion or chair which you are going to place outside right now there in the center of the head. This is going to be your place for meditation throughout this workshop and throughout life. It's nice to make it a good place to worship. Decorate it. You can buy the best chair free of cost today and place it in, inside behind the eyes. Imagine the chair. Imagine you are sitting on it. Imagine it's the center of the head. Imagine the two ears are on your side. Imagine the top of the head is above you now. You no pressure on the eyes, nor any pressure on the head. Pure imagination. Locate yourself and see what happens. The tendency often is to go move towards the eyes, forward. If that happens, push yourself back. You have your inner feet there at the floor. If you push with the floor, you move back. Go precisely in line with the ears, around the line that connects the two ears. Go back up to that point and stay there. Do not push so hard that you fall out of the back, but you stay in the center. Do not worry about what you see or think. Think of the location only. Think of where you are in the head. If lights come, colors come, patterns come in front of you, ignore them. Any sound comes, ignore it. Just locate yourself. Examine the inside of your head. You are in the center. What's above you? What is on the side of you? How far are the eyes in front of you? Are you really centered? Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. I'll come back. How many of you could center yourself in the head as I was suggesting? How many of you found it difficult to do? A little more practice. It happened. <clears throat> This is a very necessary part to have effective meditation. So this practice without putting strain, physical strain on the head is necessary. But once you are able to place yourself in the head, then if you are initiated and you have the mantra with you, what words to repeat, you repeat them slowly. If you repeat them too fast, you are not really listening to them. If you repeat deliberately, listening to every syllable, your attention gets limited there. So it's very important that the words should be repeated slowly and with attention on each word, listening to how the syllable sounds, how each syllable sounds. Let's do that now. Let's close your eyes. And those who do not have initiation, 
can coin a short mantra of their own. A mantra that expresses either their desire to go within or express an expression of love for somebody. If they have an expression of love, they can repeat a few words of that and coin their own mantra. But those who are initiated use the mantra given by the master. Okay, close your eyes, center yourself and the eyes and with your mind, not with your tongue, with your mind start repeating. If your tongue also starts moving along with it, in the beginning it doesn't matter. Eventually, the tongue will not move, only the mind will repeat the words. And you listen to them intently as you repeat. Slowly, deliberately listening to every syllable of the words. Repeat the words. If you hear any sound, then you listen to the sound, give up the words. If the sound disappears, repeat the words again. Stay in the center. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. I'll come back. <coughs> How many of you could really do exactly to repeat the words or listen to them? How many of you enjoyed this exercise? Oh, that's a much larger number. Thank you. <laughs> now, there is a third uh, practice that can be done independently, can overlap with the other two practices. And that is called the practice of dhyan. Dhyan means contemplation, contemplation of the face of the master. This is specially designed so that we can recognize if the master's astral form appears later on in meditation. By dhyan, again it's an imaginary exercise that you think of the master and talk to the master. If the image of the face of the master can be coined up by your imagination and it's not the master, only an imaginary image, if you repeat the five words given at initiation, face will disappear. At least the eyes and the forehead will disappear, will not be able to stay as the power of those five words. The power of the Simran is that if the mind tries to make up an image and starts talking to us as if it is the master, the five words dispel that and the eyes cannot stay. You can try it anytime. You try to think of the face and repeat the five words, it disappears. The eyes cannot be seen. The forehead cannot be seen. The rest of the face sometimes is visible. But the eyes and the forehead cannot be copied either by the mind or by Karl or by any negative force in the whole world, in the whole universe. It's a big precaution. People say, how can we get protected from the negative powers of Karl and mind? That's the way. That if you repeat the five words, that image disappears. 
So that is why the practice of dhyan or practice of contemplation of the face of the master is very useful. Because later on, if you are not careful, the mind can play tricks like that. And you have to check it out that this is not just a mind game, it's really the master. If you see the image of the master, even made up by your own imagination, and it is sustained and does not go away, and confirms I am there, even after you say the five words, take it from me, the master is there with you. You can even talk to that master, you can talk to that image, and in practice it is as good as getting the radiant form of the master at the astral stage later on. So that's a big advantage. The practice of dhyan can be done independently at any time. It can be done along with your simran. If you feel like it, that the mind is thinking of other pictures coming up in front of you, then picture the master is doing. And during the listening of the sound, also you can practice the arm. So in all three forms, it can be practiced and is a help. During uh, several, during the repetition, there is a further advantage that if the master's image can be maintained, you can ask the man, uh, master to do the simran for you. Then instead of asking your mind to do the simran, the master appears in front and does the simran for you, you just become a listener and enjoy the master's doing work for you, including meditation for you. The meditation is one of the early stages of progress on the spiritual path. Later on, the spiritual path is an automatic journey. Once you get attached to the sound current, it will happen automatically. You just have to sit anywhere. You don't even have to close your eyes. With practice, you reach a point where you can attach yourself to the sound current and travel anywhere you like, even with your eyes open, even while you're walking and talking. So it's a very remarkable thing, but needs a lot of practice. And with practice, you'll be able to get that. The master doing meditation for you is only a reflection of the master being able to do everything for you, even in life. When you do your physical work outside, if you think the master is doing it, he will do it. But if you say, Master, I want to do something and I just want your help, then our ego gets involved and the I-ness comes up that I want to do it. And master says, okay, you go and try your best and I'll give you some help. But you go, I'll give you a long rope to do this. But when we say, Master, you take over this work. And this body, this mind of mine, use it only as an instrument. Then Master does everything for us. He does not only internal meditation for us, he does external work for us. Everything can be attributed. Till you have that experience of the Master doing everything for you, you can give credit to the Master from time to time. that This was a good thing done. Master, I know only you could have done it and therefore thank you very much for that. I express my gratitude. By thanking the master for things that are happening in your life where you think you had a part, a role to play, it's, it's good because it's a preparation for the time when master will do everything and you'll be able to feel that everything is being done automatically by the master and you are merely being an instrument, a created instrument for that work. It's a great experience also. So these are uh, uh, essential methods. Now, in this last exercise, uh, did any one of you get to hear any sounds coming up? It's good. When the sound comes, it is not necessary to repeat the words. Sometimes the repetition of words at the same time when the sound is coming interferes with the sound's intensity and makes it stay at that level. So putting attention from words to the sound helps and the sound then picks you up. I would like you to practice uh, the uh, dhyan, contemplation of the face of the master, along with the rest of the meditation, which means do the meditation starting by locating yourself in the center of the head. Start repeating the words, contemplate the form of the master, See if you can ask the master to do the repetition for you. And if the sound comes, switch from the words 
to the sound and enjoy the company of the master while you both listen to the sound inside your head. That's a complete uh, meditation technique that we use. Let's see if you can do it. Close your eyes and begin. <laughs> Use all three. Simran, which is repetition of words. Bhajan, which is listening to the sound. Dhyan, which is contemplating the form of the master. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back to the workshop. How many of you enjoyed this session? I think it was more successful than the previous two sessions. I am very happy. I am happy you are all doing well on understanding what we are doing. We are merely trying to gather our attention to our own self. We are putting our attention to the point in our head from where it originates, from where consciousness operates and makes everything visible and experienced by us. By doing that, we discover who we are. Gradually, we open up the inner doors and we see that this experience outside is not the only experience that exists. There are many other worlds and universes at higher levels of experience existing within us. And we open them, we open up new worlds around us. We can experience them like we experience this world. So it is all inside us. The entire universe that exists outside is also existing inside us. We project it outside and make it appear outside. We project time, space, everything outside and make it appear like it's really outside. And we live it as if it is really a reality created outside. There are many realities like this that existed within ourselves. By practice, you'll be able to see them. I will take a little break now to give some interviews because I have a long list of interviews. I don't know where the list has gone. I think yes, he has it. And the interviews, many of you have asked for personal interviews because the number of people asking for interviews is very large. They have to, by this constraint of time, be limited to a few minutes each. So choose the most important question that you want to ask during that short period of interview. And for longer questions, you can write to me, email to me. Some of you already do it. And I do, when I get time, respond to all the emails that I get. Or you can write letters and I respond to them too. But any urgent thing that you have, you can ask in the personal interview that you will get. The order of interviews will be that those who have come from outside this country to come a long way, they get the first, first chance to meet me individually. Those who could not come last time, this happens to be none this time, when there are people whose interviews left over and they could not be accommodated in the time we have, they are carried forward to the next event and placed at the top of the list. So those people actually precede everybody we complete the old list first, then we start with those who have come from outside. Then the next group of people is those who have never had an interview before. So they get a chance. Then the final group is of people who have asked for interview. Their names are arranged in the order in which they have asked. Except that some of you who may be leaving in the middle of the middle of the 
um, workshop for some reason, urgent reason, we accommodate them earlier. So Connie is the person who does this. Uh, and uh, if you have not given your name and would like to let Connie know, if your turn can come, she already has a big list prepared and took it back from me this morning to add more names, I guess. So uh, I will spend some time now for the interviews. Then we'll have some dinner break. After dinner break, we'll have another session of meditation here. Meantime, consider this as your social hour. To meet each other and to exchange your views and to find from some of the older people who have been meditating for a long time what the secret of their success is. Thank you very much.